afternoon, our talk is entitled, Now We See Light. The drama of our existence is inextricably woven into a light pattern. When light is considered from the inner and esoteric standpoint. We deal with two kinds principally of light. We deal with physical light, the light of the sun, the secondary illumination that comes through our luminaries such as the electric lights, fluorescent bulbs and so forth, and we deal with what is known as spiritual light the strange and almost incomprehensible mystery of the spiritual light is that all physical light such as comes from the sun, electricity, candle flames and so forth is also as we learn derived from the one source of light for light and power are virtually synonymous in the sense that power can be used to produce light and light scientifically as well as spiritually can be used to produce power. The whole natural chain of causation is a very wonderful chain when examined from the scientific aspect. It is also even more wonderful when examined from the spiritually scientific aspect because in one sense of the word, we today are pioneers even at the same time that we are inheritors of the work of men and women who were pioneers because it's almost like saying which way is up, which way is down. Where do we really start the chain of causation? It is reasonable to suppose that all cause comes from the first cause, which is God. I myself never actually begin to think about the principle of the first cause without being virtually moved by it to a point of positive enjoyment. In other words, if I for even one moment am to contemplate the very idea of God as first cause, it immediately commences to generate within me, in my heart flame, that is, in the center of my physical being, in the center of my natural domain, in my mind, everywhere that I am, I feel a sudden sense of power, a sense of wonder, a sense of mystery, a sense of gratitude, an overpowering sense of awe because now I find that we lately removed in time from that first cause are yet linked to it by indissolvable links and that regardless of the appearance world or all things that may telegraph messages to the contrary, we are still a vitally connected being. Why then, we ask ourselves, is it true that we are surrounded by seeming limitations in our world? These limitations take myriad forms. We have the limitations of age, of physical strength. We have the limitations of mental capacity. We have the limitations of spiritual attainment which seem to exist. I think that some of these limitations function within the domain of necessity, that they exist by reason of cosmic law and the fiats of cosmic law. I think that some limitations are extremely beneficial. For example, the limitation that actually will inhibit our lifting capacity preventing us perhaps from a serious rupture of our vital organs. 
If we were able to lift more with our muscles, we might exert ourselves and strain ourselves. So that sometimes limitation is very beneficent. There are other types of limitation that are self-imposed or that are imposed upon us by others, which constitute an act that impedes the flow of the vital energies that we need for the functions of our existence. Man can live, of course, as a vegetable. This is actually what many people do. They draw in nutriments through the opening at one end of the spine and pass them out the other end. And basically this little vegetable goes on and the vital functions continue. And I suspect that if the soul were not involved, that man would perhaps be very content to remain a vegetable and lead a vegetable type of existence, although he does have mobility. So the mobile vegetable moves around and perhaps in many cases few people really suspect the primary reason why they were brought into being and why the statement was made that you should take dominion over the earth. When we stop to consider the animalism that is prevalent in our times as well as in past times and the results of animalism that have produced a human jungle here below where violence is still in vogue and is found as the only solution to human problems, we actually begin to wonder just why did God ever create in the first place this man made in his image and in his likeness who seems to have trampled so much upon that image, not only in himself, but in others. I think, however, that we would be selling our Father in heaven short if we were to accept this idea of the human vegetable, and I'm sure you don't. We are made in the divine image, and whether or not we have always expressed the meaning of that image in our daily life, whether the hieroglyphs of the Spirit have been translated into action or not, we are able to apprehend and sense in our minds and souls a great deal more of the law than we put into actual practice. In fact, we are actually mediators ourselves. And this may come as a bit of a surprise to some. Our mediatorship, however, is not intended to replace the mediatorship of the Christ, but is intended to enter into complete harmony with his mediatorship. And we are intended to act between the elemental manifestations of life, and this is what is meant by the statement, take dominion over the earth. But this is only one of the many functions of man. Man has another function, which is to elevate the supremacy of the soul into its pristine image to return, in other words, to the Father. We went forth into the world of form to take dominion over the earth in order to assist elemental life in itself being raised toward the human kingdom. Some of you are probably aware of the statement concerning the brotherhood of angels, elementals, and men. The angelic host, of course, in most cases have never known embodiment upon this planet. Most of the angels are functional within the domain of heaven. In one sense, as they have said it themselves, puppets to the will of God, but willing puppets. They're happy to be that. Because they have no other will, supposedly, except the will of God, the statement was made, made a little lower than the angels, but crowned with more glory. How could something made a little lower than the angels be crowned with more glory simply because once man can actually accept the freedom of the will of God and make it his own, man then, because he has chosen God, whereas the angels have simply accepted the fiats of the controls of the divine will, man becomes crowned with more glory and honor because he has accepted the primacy of the Godhead as his own. And so he is actually drawn into a closer state of divinity than the angelic host 
for they are under the divine image, whereas man is made in the divine image. You see, they are under the direction of the divine image. He didn't say that he made the angels in the divine image. Do you understand? This is a very important point. Now, the elementals are, in one sense of the word, without a permanent soul. The elementals primarily were endowed with the power to transmit their hereditary characteristics to other elementals. And they generically convey their a commission from the Godhead to their offspring. They marry and have children, and they have a period of time in which they live upon the planetary body in their state primarily invisible to us. I personally on the inner have seen these tiny beings and I have also been apprised as to their role in the magnificent causationary chain, in other words, a chain of cause in the nature kingdom. I was particularly interested at one time and one of the masters was giving me information on the elementals to observe the purettes and the various acrobatic maneuvers reminiscent of the finest ballet dancers such as Pavlova and uh, Nureyev. And I was uh, specifically uh, pleased and delighted to learn that mankind, through some form of uh, spiritual alchemy, has actually picked up many of these most gracious and graceful movements of the little gnomes, the elementals, the uh, beings of the air, the sylphs, and the fire elementals, as well as uh, the ondines or water elementals. We find some of this reflected in the water music of Handel, and it is a most magnificent work. We also find that throughout the musical scores of various composers of the past, the work of the elementals is made known. Now Grieg, in his Hall of the Mountain King, has also brought out some of the very rapid movements of the elemental kingdom. It is true that to the ordinary orthodox person related solely to Western Christianity, these things are scarcely made known, being considered to be primarily mythological and non-existent. However, we have come to realize that the kingdom of God is filled with innumerable mysteries, and one of the mysteries to the average individual is the manifestation of the elementals. So in our story, now we see light, we must take into arrangement the facts of the existence of the elementals because they are a vital link in the chain of nature. Now I want to finish one particular point here and that is that they are endowed with a very limited lifespan which exceeds ours by at least ten. Most elementals are not old until they are around 900 years old. They were tied into the original actual vibration that Methuselah and others had in the very early days in the manifestation of man upon the planet. However, they pass on and they do sometimes have white beards and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs that Mr. Disney brought out was actually a bit true, you see, even though it was a fairy tale. I mean, it had some validity because they do get old and unfortunately they die and as has been pointed out, when they die they have no hope of immortality as we do because they were created as all growing things are, the falling roses, the falling leaves and the things of nature. We do not think of the rose being reborn, we do not think of our cucumbers and squash as being reborn we see that the seeds fall to the ground and reproduce themselves, which is entirely a different activity than actually being reborn where you involve consciousness. However, the strange thing about the elementals is that they do have consciousness. And when they finally do die, they do indeed cease to exist. Their existence, however, continues by reason of their progeny, their offspring. And so elementals are always having young ones up to a certain age and there are family ties and very realistic commitments that are made with them. For many a year, I would say, the thought has come forth in the cosmos 
to convey elemental immortality upon those individual beings. But this has never actually been done. And so you see the original sorrow at funerals, which is actually patterned after by human beings, was more or less borrowed from the lamentations of the elementals because when they actually lose members of their family, they are not ever replaced, death being to them permanent. And there therefore was a great wail that went up from them. And this was actually the way in which mankind developed the consciousness of weeping and crying and lamenting at funerals because of the fact that the elementals did it. <coughs> because heaven has also then conspired to recognize the actual wonder of these tiny creatures, some of whom have actually made the grade into the human kingdom. As St. Germain has pointed out in his book, Epithodora, which is Aphrodite spelled backwards. We come to realize that occasionally we are actually facing a mortal person who is a cross between an elemental and a human being. I realize this seems to be a very strange thing, but then as has been said, there are more strange things in thy philosophy than thou hast dreamt of. And so man, who claims to be the acme of all perfection and knowledge, is deficient in many things simply because he relegates great truths to the realm of superstition. Now I do not think that we should become superstitious to the point where we are open funnels to accept every psychic nuts idea as to what actually exists in the world. But when we are dealing with such evidences as the manifestations of great alchemists of the past, which is Robert Flood, Le Comte du Saint-Germain, and numbers of others, Count Cagliostro, who was of course repudiated by some and others, Paracelsus, and so forth, we should realize that there is some basis for the statements which they have made. Certainly, they were not entirely mystical, not entirely dealing with impracticalities. They had some real concealments in their similes, in their allegories, and in their statements. Very well. We find then that at the present time, insofar as our researches have taken us, that elementals do not have immortality. One. Two, that there are movements in the divine congress of the cosmos, and votes are being taken, and lobbying is going on on behalf of the little elementals, that someday, some way, a means be found to confer the grace of immortality upon them. This is sort of a pact between the angels because, you see, the angels, some of them have been elementals. And some have made it all the way from a tiny elemental, charged with the responsibility of bringing forth one or more of a variety of flowers, who then bridged the human gap and made it all the way up to an angel and then to an archangel. Somehow or other, we, with our little horse-blinded concepts in this world, have come to the conclusion that we know the laws of the universe. We think that nothing worth knowing is held by anyone outside of ourselves. And what a preposterous thing this is, because certainly as we gaze out on the cosmos that we're seeking to explore, we must realize that there in that place where worlds without end are turning are many mysteries that will not for many a year be probed by us and then probably will be probed on a very limited basis by us. Unless we can solve the mystery of interplanetary travel so that we can actually move forward from the planet Earth to remote places in the cosmos at a faster speed than what we are proposing now to travel, we could travel 25 years out in one direction to some place and 25 years back taking up 50 years of our earth time and finding most of our relatives, friends, and perhaps even our governments changed by the time we got back home. So this is very impractical. And we must be content to let the vision or the glimpses of the cosmos 
come to us through spiritual means and by the spiritual intelligences who certainly have the capacity to make interplanetary explorations without spaceships or wings. They can move with the benefit of eternal consciousness anywhere and they do not need to actually consume the commodity we call time in doing so. We certainly would not deny the Almighty that power, nor can we deny him the power to confer this upon those he has made in his own image. Once those individuals are able to accept the light of his intention in the light that it was intended to manifest, in other words, the knowledge of what man was intended to be, as St. Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We must acknowledge then that the divine consciousness was a specific part of the nature of the great master Jesus, that was not always at every single moment of his life operative, contrary to mortal opinion. When Lazarus, his very best friend, died, he didn't even know it because he may then have been on an excursion into the higher consciousness dealing with vast and weighty cosmic matters. But when it was told to him, he wept and he subsequently raised him from the dead. So we see that the consciousness of duality existed in him as well as in us. I think the primary difference in us and the great master Jesus is that we are primarily 99% of the time living in the earth consciousness in our waking hours while he lived about 1% of his time in the earthly consciousness and 99% of his time in the heavenly consciousness. And this we have to learn to do at the present time for most of us to be propelled out of our human sense desires, out of the awareness of personality would be an unnerving experience for us. We are simply not ready to receive all of that and therefore we must be content with prayers, uh, various types of communications with studies about the Father in heaven. We must be content with meditation. We must be content with attainment. Uh, gradually unfolded, climbing the cycles of life step by step and being grateful that the time may come when the wonderful process of initiation will suddenly rocket us past the whole series of steps into a higher plateau of achievement. This comes when man is ready for it. If it comes prematurely, it might drive us insane. This is one of the problems today that is often taking place in hippiedom and in the cult of the drug users because these individuals, as they seek to unfold by the use of psychedelic drugs and strobe lights and various other things, the latent uh, higher consciousness or just the consciousness that seeks expansion, they enter the realms of the psychic and the realms of delirium tremens and the realms of dreams and hallucinations to where they can scarcely distinguish after a while rationality and reality from the realm of dreams and the figments of dreams. So in our talk this afternoon, we are interested in clarification of some of these things to which we have now given prelude. Let us then take for a moment our consciousness backward to the purposes of creation and there we find that the eternal, uh, called by any other name as the Hindus say in their song, Raghupathi Raja Raja Ram, go into Hari Hari, go into Hari Hari, go into Hari Hari, and so forth. Uh, they say in that song, which was Gandhi's favorite, call him by any other name, he is still God. And so as we come to the idea of the Eternal Father, and we will not find it descriptory to call him the Father, Mother, God, because we can recognize the androgynous nature of God. We can see that the male and female consciousness existed in the Father and exists also in the Divine Mother. And we are not particularly perturbed by the idea of God as a mother any more than we would by the idea of God as a father. And uh, as St. Paul said when he came to Mars Hill, you have an altar here, 
upon which you have inscribed the Greek words to the unknown God, whom you therefore ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, he says, God that made the heavens and the earth, seeing that he dwells not in temples made with hands, him declare I unto you. He said, he dwells not in temples made with hands. Him declare I unto you is what he said. So we see then that uh, the physical places that we have created to uh, make and construct altars to God, these in a sense have only the validity that we choose to endow them. And there is no idol in this world, our graven image, which we can make that will actually have any particular specific spiritual power. And the gravest danger we can have is to think that we ourselves idolatrously are of greater importance than the temple of God, which we are. In other words, we choose to actually accept our physical presence, our human personality with all of its changeable nature, as the real important man and we deny the divine image. We deny the voice of him who has said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and this is what we do. We put ourselves first and God second. And this is the first error of man and I think the original sin. We consider that we need to be as wise as God. And so the little monadic creation, the spirit spark of man implanted in a coat of skins, decides that he is going to become as wise as God and do it by intelligent means. He is going to codify the universe, cut it into pieces, bisect it, run it through a computer, and then have some sort of a spectrographic analysis of all the cosmos. And when he is all done with it, what will he have but the witch's brew that we hear the little witch singing where she says, bippity-boppity-boo, what have you got? Put them all together and you have bippity-boppity-boo. And that's about all you have got, too. Because we can dissect things to the point where they no longer have any relevance or validity. It's like going up to a very fine painting. All we see is a pile of pigment piled on top of each other in varying colors. And very rustic and craggy at that. When we draw back and from a distant place, we look at the picture, we see the magnificence of Titian coming out. We see the beauties of the sunset we see the work of Rubens, we see any of the great master artists. And we appreciate it from the distance. But when we get too close, we destroy it. And so in our desire to analyze, we continually destroy the vision that God would give us of life. So I want to take you back this afternoon to the primacy of life. I want to take you back to the point where we can together say, now we see light. Because light is synonymous with the idea of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We can only conceive of God as a great central sun. Central in the sense that all things came forth from that sun. I am that I am. Being, beingness, consciousness, identity, all of that and the repository of all universal intent and universal will. He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He's not only the dot in the middle of the circle, he is the circle. He is the warp and woof of creation, in addition to being the conceiver of all that is. But we have to recognize that somewhere along the line, this light, this intelligence that came forth and produced the miracle of cosmos has also endowed manifestation or man with an opportunity to become one with him. The process of generating a God or regenerating him is such that you do not start and manufacture God. No. You have to confer a divine image, your own image upon man and make him a manifestation of yourself. And you do this through the process of emanation. E, energy, man in action. And the energy of God then went forth and prepared a place. As Jesus said, I will prepare a place for you that where I am, there may ye be also. 
And we have to understand that we're dealing now with the duality of God the Father sending man forth from his heavenly home, which is the great central sun, and the light rays emanate out into the cosmos, producing first the planetary homes, galaxies, solar systems, and worlds without end that would become the habitation of man, the manifestation. This was the outbreathing of the eternal, the breath of the eternal by which all things were made, the Christos, the light, the light emanations, the only begotten of the Father. Matter is synonymous with mother, mater, or materiality. And so substance was born in order to provide a body to house the soul, a planet to house the souls upon, and all nature was given the fiat from God to bring forth the abundance of her crops and her gifts and bounties to man so that he could live upon this planet, go through the tenure of existence, and eventually assert and claim his joint heirship with the Christ, the original emanation or first begotten from the Father that was before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. Therefore, when you stop to realize this, we see the outbreathing of the Father, the outgoing breath of Brahma that goes out into the universe and then at a certain epoch in the adventure called time draws back that substance into himself. Now if the inbreathing of cosmos I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there ye may be also is too rapid. If it is too rapid there would be a natural destructivity to the cosmos that was undeveloped. The areas of the cosmos, the manifestations that remained as a lump of flesh, insensate to the divine vibrations, not active in divine principle, unable to perform the acts of the cosmic masters, such individuals when they approach the Godhead in the indrawing breath would be actually burned as by fire they would be consumed because the vibratory actions of the higher octaves drawn by the divine magnet, would cause them to perish. St. Paul was fully aware of this, and he brought it out in his statement where he said, Now the fire, brethren, shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If the work that he has builded upon this foundation be wood or stubble or hay, it will be burned, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now we see that the idea of re-embodiment was actually the mercy of God that sent man down into earth where he by riotous living and distortion abused the body that was given to him and the precious treasures and destroyed his vital energies to the point where the body could no longer house the soul, the immortal soul that yearned to breathe freedom. And so the soul would permit the shattering of the body temple knowing that a nobler temple would at last take its place. And we find this in the great poem, The Chambered Nautilus, I believe by uh, Wendell Holmes, where he says, Build thee more stately mansions, O my soul, while the vast seasons roll. Leave thy low vaulted past. Let each dome nobler than the last lead thee to heaven with a dome more vast or something similar to that. And if I've quoted it wrong, it doesn't make any difference because you get the idea anyway. It's the idea of the seashell now left cast upon the beaches of life and discarded from which the vital fish has fled to go on and build itself a new one. And so we see in uh, the chambered nautilus the important thing that we're dealing with here is that man is able to return uh, and once again take in a dish of oatmeal. You know, he sometimes has it running down his chin. But uh, he has to learn to eat all over again. Now, one of the unfortunate things about ordinary Western Christianity is that they have deliberately, mind you, distorted, and I say purposefully, the magnificent truths of God that come from the Far East. Now, everything in the Far East is not gold, even when it glitters. But everything in the West is not gold either when it glitters. One of the great misconceptions of the world centers around the idea of metempsychosis the idea of what we call re-embodiment being called reincarnation by many people. In the doctrine of transmigration of souls, which is an Eastern doctrine, 
we find that because of the good or bad which men do in one embodiment, they imagine that they come back in a testy fly or a sacred cow. And they won't kill a fly or a cow or eat a cow because it might be their grandmother. Such things are absolutely superstitious, rooted in superstition, and have no validity to the sincere spiritual student. Let me then point out the doctrine that is acceptable to the great white brotherhood, to the masters of wisdom, and to God himself, because it happens to be true. And that is the process called re-embodiment. Re-embodiment is increasingly becoming made known to Western man. It is also becoming accepted by many Christians throughout the world who see nothing wrong with it. It simply means that God has extended his mercy beyond the span of one lifetime. He has afforded men who could not complete their work in one lifetime an opportunity to once again take up where they left off. And many times they do. Some of the young prodigies today then, at the age of two or three, once again resuming their seat at the piano with a stool right there too. You know that old one? They laughed when I sat down to the piano. Someone had taken away the stool. <laughs> well, these children sit down to the piano and they play, and they play beautifully. And these prodigies, as they're called, are actually the re-embodiment of great musicians, great artists, or other artisans who come forth once again to finish their work. And there, of course, you get into Wordsworth's Ode to Immortality. Uh, if I could quote that one, you'd really have something. But it's rather involved. Be that as it may, we see then the light of purpose behind the cosmos and we see that that purpose has been thwarted and distorted by what I am this afternoon going to term secondary control of creation. Secondary control of creation is the institution of the human will as an ascendant will that supersedes the original divine intent. In other words, man is also a creator as God is a creator. And when man begins to create, if he does not create in congruency and consonance with the divine will, he is creating against and opposing the divine will. And when he does this, sickness and disease, unhappiness and scorn come into manifestation. And when they do, the fruit of that is the violence of our world, the misery of our world, the divorces in our world that occur because people can't get along, the struggle for money, for dollars, for possessions, for health, uh, for eminence among their community, the struggle for name and fame, the desire to perpetuate their physical name and family and all that they touch and put their branding iron upon it. All of that is, of course, amusing from the standpoint of the gods themselves who actually look down and are somewhat amazed at the antics of men. And now so we come to the point where we deal with one particular subject which I am vitally interested in because I recall well the temple that we builded long ago at Fayum, at Lake Morius in Egypt. I am aware of the great obelisk there of which today one of them stands in Central Park in New York, the other being in Trafalgar Square in London. I'm aware of those great obelisks and I'm aware of the original intent of monotheism that was brought forth at the time of Amenhotep IV in Egypt and during the reign of Nefertiti. We find then that uh, monotheism was not too much into prominence hitherto. The gods of Thebes and the gods of ancient Egypt uh, being involved in a whole panoply of gods or pantheism such as Anubis and many of the other gods of ancient Egypt. The one god was then declared first by Amenhotep IV or Ikhenaten who of course was supposed to be the heretic king as far as the priests of Thebes were concerned. And his wife Nefertiti, he then bringing up his great temple at Tel El Amarna which was later smashed and destroyed and uh, brought downward. We are able today to understand that monotheism or the belief in one God is primary to the teachings of the great white brotherhood. And I would like this afternoon to point out that we in our teachings do not believe in two gods or three gods or four gods, but in one God. 
But we do believe that this one God, through the universal Christ, the pristine or first cause, the first emanation that goes out, has created a garment of light and that that light is the spiritual substance or divine mediatorship of every human soul. Every one of us have a spark of that light within ourselves. Who are we anyway? Just who in the world are we? Oh, you say your name is John Gluck and you hope you have luck. You depend on fate. You think maybe by fate you might make it. Well, it won't work that way. There are mathematical and geometrical laws in the universe that decree that a man has to actually act according to these laws or he will be lost in the whirlwind of chaos and probably will wind up a second, third, or fourth, or fifth-rate person. In order to embellish the person with the crown of life, which is the fulfillment of God intent, a man must become aware of his immortal destiny. He must become aware of the image of God, which he does best through attainment or attunement, excuse me, with his own beloved Holy Christ Self, HCS. I was raised during the time when Roosevelt was in power. Anyway, the Holy Christ Self, or higher mental body, is endowed by God with holding the divine image for every life stream. And Jesus the man was the first who actually manifested the fullness of the stature of the Holy Christ Self. And he demonstrated for all time that a man could become one with God. That is why he said, I and my Father are one. But the biggest problem in the world today is the fact that in the darkness of humanity's concepts and their desire to seize a God, whether it be Caesar or Christ, they have failed to see that they themselves are gods. Moses long ago declared it unto the children of Israel, saying, Ye are gods. Jesus later cited this example and said when they accused him of blasphemy, you accuse me of blasphemy because I say I am the Son of God. He said, Moses spoke to the children of Israel to whom the word of God was spoken, saying, ye are gods, and the scripture cannot be broken. Why do you then say that I am guilty of blasphemy when I say that I am the Son of God, which is certainly a lesser image? In actuality, God intends that everyone, your maid, Yes, your little maid that waits on you in your kitchen or the little girl, the waitress that comes up where you go into a restaurant or the gas station attendant or the big senator that you sent to Washington with so much hope. Yes, the whole gang of them. They are all children of God, whether they know it or not. And they furthermore were intended to be gods. But you know what? They have made, through distortion of the scriptures, a concept in the world that is darkness, not light. They have made a concept and sense of sin in the world. And they have caused us to so condemn ourselves for all of our fancied and real wrongs that we are supposed to have done that we absolutely have to have a world savior. And according to to all reason and law, if we have a world savior who is going to do it for us, you know, let George do it. Let Jesus do it. He didn't say that. He didn't want worship. He said, he that follows me in the regeneration, he will sit beside me on my throne. That means that the one who walks in his footsteps is going to sit on the equality level with him. I couldn't imagine in my weirdest imaginings how Jesus would want to sit on a palatial throne and look down on all the poor little suckers that were down below that could never in all eternity attain that throne. They always had a look at him 
And as I know the Nazarene master, he is down here at your feet washing them. And he's wiping your feet. And he's anointing your feet. He's not up on a throne. They have distorted the image of God. They have distorted the image of Christ. And they have brought you down into a state of damnation, which means condemnation and nothing else, whereby you feel that you don't dare to do anything else but grovel in the eyes of God. You can't accept the idea that you can raise the dead. You can't accept the idea that you can walk through that physical wall. You can't accept the idea that you can float in the air or levitate. You can't accept the idea that you can say to a flower blossom and watch it unfold immediately. You can't accept the idea of the miracle sense because you're so sinful. You're so wicked that God is apt to appear at any time and execute judgment upon you. I have examined the people of this earth and I know plenty of wicked people. But I'm going to tell you I know so many people who are so close to sainthood by all that they do. And they're not all in our church, they're in many churches. They're just marvelous people. But their goodness and the wicked people's wickedness isn't going to actually turn the tables. The wicked people's wickedness may come back in such a manner in some coming embodiment that they will turn around as Mary Magdalene did and repudiate the darkness that they have acted under and the last may be first while the first are last. Not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so when we see light we must understand that there are mysteries in the universe to be known and that our dogmas often act as a screen, an opaquing screen, that will not permit us to see the face of the living God. The pure in heart shall see God. And there was nothing said about what they believed. It was a matter of the qualification of the heart by purity. And purity is a quality of God. My strength is as the strength of ten because my heart is pure is a state of the divine consciousness and I don't care who manifests it. If you can grasp the principle that you can be purified by the Spirit and then let the Spirit do its perfect work, you can see God. If you can see God, the next step is you can be God. And once again, we find the divine master down at our feet, washing our feet. He doesn't care one bit about surrendering his kingdom to you. He created all these things for you. He created them for your glory. He wants you to enter into it. And the sooner you do, the happier he's going to be. Can you imagine God up there in heaven looking down at these riots and commotions in our land, at the psychedelic pictures, the vicious, horrific manifestations that the masters are telling us about that we already see all around us? Can you imagine the masters or God himself encouraging our daughters to go out and give their bodies in brothels all over the country and on hillsides to bearded creatures that are out here taking psychedelic poison into their body and mind? Can you imagine that as the destiny of man, the noble man made in the image of God? It reminds me of Mark Anthony's funeral oration at Caesar's funeral. I mean, it's, it's a horrible idea. Perfectly horrible. God is interested in goodness and the nature of the powers of darkness, of the satanic powers that have divided our world through religion, that have divided our world through politics, that have divided our world through race as well as creed, that have divided our world by destroying our faith. These satanic powers cut off themselves from the grace of God, denied a flow of energy from the divine light, are today vampirizing man's energy. And in order to vampirize it, mankind have to be made to fight one another and to die and to bleed. Because only by death, by the shedding of blood, and by the absorption of the life energy from man can the dark forces be kept alive. They thrive as parasites upon mortal consciousness. 
and they are responsible for all dark and depraved acts of humanity today. They are responsible for everything that takes place in consciousness that puts men in lunatic asylums. They are responsible for everything that causes and creates drunkenness and broken homes. They are responsible for the problems between nations. And they are responsible for all things that cause unhappiness. Now we see light. We see what light did not produce, but we see that which the secondary creation of man the misqualification of his energy has produced in the world. And we realize that this is not the kingdom of God. Can any of you people today in this place put up your hands and tell me that you think this world is the kingdom of God? It is the schoolroom of earth where men are learning to become gods. The only problem here is that it's not a very harmonious schoolroom. It's the kind of schoolroom that we're seeing now on the crowded campuses of our major universities in the land. Chaos is everywhere, and we seek peace and pursue it. But the only peace that we can ever have is the peace of the living God, the peace of the Christ. And that comes to us through true religious experience. You can study William James' variety of religious experiences if you want to. You can go ahead and study the various cults of the land. You can study the Pentecostal experience. You can study the experiences of the old fire-breathing preachers. You can study the experiences of the Dunkers and the Mennonites. You can follow the various prophets that have existed in our country, such as Joseph Smith and all these others. You can go ahead and follow anybody you want to follow. You're absolutely free. But if you're going to see light, you're going to have to go beyond any prophet. You're going to have to go back to the original idea of God that brought forth all religion in the beginning. You're going to have to recognize that something's wrong with our civilization. And you're going to have to realize why it's wrong. And then you're going to have to say, well, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And when you say that, you're going to start the regenerative power of God acting in your world. And nothing will ultimately be hidden from you that you need to know, providing you are content to wait patiently and possess your souls by divine grace. I have seen people that seek by psychic means to open the doorway of Pandora's box. Pan means the wide spectrum. Aura means the oracle or opening, the orifice. So Pandora's box means opening the powers of the hidden world to view without having the spiritual understanding to govern those forces. It reminds me of the story of the sorcerer's apprentice. And so I adjure you, one and all, to understand that the safety of the great white brotherhood teachings, the safety of the ascended master's teachings, the safety of the truth is here. It's here for you. It cannot be given out in one easy lesson. There are mysteries to it, but I tell you it pays to bide your time, to try to rid yourself through the correct use of the violent flame of the negative energy that surrounds every life stream, to recognize that in the course of your own evolution, as the concentric rings of manifestation have appeared, there has been soot and darkness and despair in your own life in the past. We must rid ourselves of it and of the residual substance that it actually is so that it does not recreate negativity in our world. We must open the pores of our consciousness to God and drink in the divine light. We must realize that it's there like the air, it's free. It's God's and it's pure energy. And when we do that, we can actually not only accept the Christ, we can be the Christ and he'll share his crown with us happily. And then we'll all live happily ever after. And this will not be someone's fairy dream or pipe dream. It will be the fulfillment of the eternal dream that first went forth and produced the mystery of light. I thank you.